is stabilized, so we're going to get started. Welcome everyone. This is the uh, MA workshop on open science. There was a, a big paper in 2010, 2011 about uh, being able to predict the future that was published in our uh, sort of core journal JPSP, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to when it was even more clear that our field had major problems, 2015, 2016, when there were more uh, replication projects, which is when we try and run the exact same project and find the same result. This is standard practice in other fields. Um, and a surprising amount of psychology studies and particularly social psychology studies did not replicate. The uh, nature responded to this by surveying a large group of scientists about whether there is a reproducibility crisis, which is a slightly different word, and I'll explain what I mean by those terms in a second. Uh, but yes, a lot of people think there is a crisis. Psychology has been called amazingly significant. And this is because on the left here, you can see that estimates of how many papers there are with positive results is overwhelming, like nearly 100% of papers report positive results. But at the same time, we know that cannot be possible uh, in the data in an unbiased look, because the probability of finding an effect, even if it exists based on statistical power, has to be about half that much. And that is the absolute upper end for how many effects there should be. And we will talk more about power in the session about power, but what it is is it is a way that we can tell in a body of literature or in an entire field about how much likelihood there is of finding an effect, even if the effect is true. And we don't have great power, so we can't possibly have this many real results, even without looking at what they are. So key terms. If you take the exact same uh, type of uh, study and then you run it again in a different sample, we call that generally a replication. So that's the upper right here. Same analysis, different data. Now, reproducibility is even using the same data, can you generate the same analyses? Like I've posted my code online and the data and can someone else even run my code to generate the same results? And it's surprisingly common that uh, it's not even reproducible what people have done. Theses are a particular uh, offender here. I mean, people often, I would say the norm is to sort of click through menus in a program such as Jasper, SPSS, not report what was done, Exactly. And so someone else reading your thesis couldn't even come to the same numbers that you generated uh, with the information you provide. So we'll talk today about what some of the options are. But before that, let's uh, back up and talk more broadly about the problem. There has been some really cool large scale uh, collaborative work in psychology in the last 10 years. Very exciting to me. Some of it led by Brian Nosick and the uh, other people at the Open Science Foundation. And broadly speaking, they think that they've identified replication rates of about 50%. That is 50% of the studies that they selected as being you know, important and well-established and worth testing are not replicating. There's some disagreement about what should be uh, considered a replication, you know, a p-value less than this amount, or what should we look at exactly. But I think it is fair to say that we're replicating at a much lower rate than desirable. I've borrowed many of these slides from Gilad Feldman at uh, Hong Kong University, and his general summary is that about 40% of effects replicate. And in those that do replicate, the effect sizes in the replications are about half the size of the original observation. This is also another reason why so many thesis projects end up not having significant effects, even though they have followed the methods and suggested effect sizes from the literature. A lot of that is not the student's fault. It's because many of the reported effects are false positives and or overestimates of the true effect. The good news is this is not special to psychology. This is being found in cancer biology, in medicine, in empirical computer science. It's especially bad in some fields like sports science, management science, marketing. 
Um, but what is cool about noting that lots of fields have this problem is that psychology is, I would say, at the forefront of trying to fix it. We are coming up with some really cool tools and uh, uniting around some changes to how we do business, which is going to help these other fields as well. And we can be proud of being part of those changes. Uh, here are some estimates for replication evidence for some of the sciences you might consider a little bit more solid than psychology or some others might. And in fact, these rates that you see on the right in percentages are not very good. So there's a lot of this that also cannot be either reproduced, that's uh, common in biology, or replicated. One of the ways that this manifests as a problem in the literatures is that we're reading these journals and the journals over here on, you know, if you look towards the right, for example, overwhelmingly uh, say that things work. Like almost all the papers are reporting positive effects. Here you can see that as being in green. But if you go back to the original things that happened over here in A, many of them won't find positive effects. Many things don't work or don't work as expected. Now, each step of this, like you only report the outcomes that have positive effects, or you spin the findings so that you have more focus on the things that went the way you expected, or you only cite papers that uh, show positive effects. Each of these things can distort the apparent consensus in the literature around some effect. And you can even get hundreds of supporting articles on some effect and that is not real at all. This is kind of mind blowing, but this has happened and I can point to several examples in social specifically. One, one way to think about this that I really like is by Samin Vizier, who has talked about credible or incredible research cultures. So if you start over here on the right, this is kind of how I was trained. Write papers that are like really persuasive arguments. They're advertisements for the research program. You don't provide the data. You say, take my word for it. You appeal to flair and novelty. Everything is significant. You assume that peer review will catch all the problems with that approach and you write press releases and then uh, popular press books. And then you take the most famous people who rise to the top of that and you have them give TED talks and go on lecture tours and whatever. That was how social psychology, I think, was broadly viewed and in some ways was operating in its journals. And what we're trying to do is move over towards a credible research culture where you are totally transparent with what you did you plan major decisions ahead of time. You declare conflicts of interest. All contributions are credited, uh, not just the ones that uh, are from famous people. We prioritize replications, et cetera. So this is the sweep that I'll be talking about today and I'll present it in a few different ways. These are not just individual actions. These are also changes to the whole research culture to how research is funded and rewarded and which papers are published. And you can be part of this, but it's not entirely on you to make these changes. This is a bigger movement. Me personally, I, just, I wasn't trained in methods and I wasn't trained in open science. And I started being really interested in this when I graduated with my PhD and was teaching and I was supervising student thesis projects. And I saw how stressed they were about trying to find significant results. And it was actually quite difficult for me to communicate that I didn't care whether the results were significant, that that wasn't about the quality of the thesis for me. And so I noticed this disconnect between, you know, how papers are written in psychology and the kinds of, of thesis products that I considered an excellent representation of learning goals and uh, educational, you know, purpose of doing the thesis in the first place. Then I also was interested in improving inferences in my own work because I was trained in a way of, you know, some methods of science that are not great, like collect part of the sample, analyze to see if it's looking significant. And if it is, you can stop. And if it isn't, collect some more data and uh, try again. Those lead to a lot of false positives. And uh, when I began to realize that I was, I thought, okay, well, I have to figure out how to do this right because I want to find real things so that I can work on real effects over time and not waste my time. 
This led me to two organizations in particular, the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, which is mostly student and early career, really friendly, nice people. I recommend talking to them. And the Accelerator, which is a big global consortium I'll chat about more later. In sum, we need a credibility shift. Open science is part of improving the way that we do research. Collaboration means working together more transparently, supporting one another. And students and early career researchers, I think, are the engine. It, this won't happen accidentally. It happens because we choose to do it. Okay, so where are we going you know, to create a social psychology that's more trustworthy, more reproducible, and more replicable? In particular, we're going to be start preferring simple over complex models because they're going to be easier to interpret and reproduce and replicate. Also moving away from focusing only on p-values and significance towards looking at effect sizes and confidence intervals. And for me, I consider a thesis uh, higher quality when it doesn't just hinge on p-values because they're not quite as informative as you might have thought. We'll talk about power later in another session, et cetera, et cetera. So these are for me, the components and the kinds of things that are under your control in the thesis process are down here on the left. Transparency about what you're doing. What are the materials you used? What are the data you're analyzing? You can, anon you can post the anonymous version online, uh, depending on uh, you know, how you disclose that in your ethics report and what your supervisor thinks is good. I mean, don't just throw your data online, but there is a responsible way to do this. And the code you use to analyze. Uh, and we share our entire process, including failures like we used some outcome variable and it didn't work, or we did a manipulation and it didn't seem to have any effect. You can't just drop that from the report. You should report what you did. In particular for the thesis, reporting all the research decisions, like why were certain cases excluded, what conditions were run, what were all the variables that were measured in the study helps the reader understand uh, and how to interpret your results. This, uh, this view towards transparency, replicability and replication changes how we read previous research. And we have put at the bottom uh, at the, I guess that's a little misleading to have this be a pyramid because it feels like that's the foundation. Well, anyway, I'll, maybe I'll redraw this later. But the point is at the bottom here, the status quo research, this is most research you have ever read, not pre-registered, data and materials not available for checking, just take their word for it. And we don't know what of their decisions were ahead of time or after they saw the data. Not very... Um, credible. I don't know what to take from that research. I don't believe it nearly as much as I used to. In fact, my whole career can sort of be a process of believing things less and less, which doesn't embitter me. It just, I, that skepticism helps me think about what's actually known and what's not known yet. And then moving up the scale and value, you know, exploratory work, confirmatory work, we can return to that um, distinction because it'll be useful for you in your thesis. Registered reports, uh, which are confirmatory and uh, publicly disclosed ahead of time. And then meta-analysis of registered reports, like combining multiple of these higher quality evidence. And it's only at the top here that we should be informing public policy, developing interventions that governments use, et cetera. So this is the research process, what some people have called the scientific method. And you can see these familiar steps, you know, like generate and specify hypothesis that's in the upper right. Then you design the study, you collect the data, you analyze, interpret, do your next experiment. And the thesis represents one loop. You know, you're not going to do the whole thing and then run another study, but that is what uh, researchers do. We do these loops over and over again. Um. I don't know who's unmuted, but go ahead and mute yourself. Okay. Now, problems that can come out. Ooh, problems that can come out in this research process include all these things in red. And we can talk about a couple of them. I don't need to uh, do every single one. Yes, please do mute yourself. I don't know who that is. Can I mute everyone? 
There, I muted everyone. Okay, great. So, uh, right. Let's talk about some of these that are the uh, m most important problems. Changing the hypotheses after you have done the study used to be even recommended. Uh, one of our field's important founders, Daryl Bem, specifically, you know, he, he gave advice to grad students that they should do this, but it's bad because it makes it so that we don't know how to interpret the results. So I would say changing the hypotheses after results are known. This is also called harking, H-A-R-K, that we don't want to do anymore. And just to highlight another one of these in the upper right, lack of replication. You know, how many of your master's projects were posed as replicating important previous research? I wouldn't be too surprised if none of them this cycle were doing that. And it should be a major component of what we do in the science is check to see that other work is reproducible and replicable. But we have fallen into a novelty trap where we think that everything should be new and that uh, makes it harder for us to build a solid foundation. So here are some of the things that you can do that, uh, that help. If there were no publication bias, uh, you know, then we can get rid of that problem. That means we publish things whether they're significant or not. This, uh, you know, if, if we can eliminate some kinds of researcher bias, like p-hacking, that means changing your analyses or your setup or your cleaning, whatever, to get different p-values, or post hoc hypothesizing, like hypothesizing after the research is known, then you get rid of those problems. If you ensure that people are using high statistical power, then that'll improve reproducibility and replicability, then you get rid of that problem. This incent, you know, we want to incentivize important re replication studies, the like, highest cited work, the most important whatever, uh, and then publish those replications, whether or not they're successful, that gets rid of that problem, and publicly archive the data, materials, and code, and then we will have solid science. And what's a little bit weird is that these are all called oh, the open science movement, but they just sound to me like good quality science. We just didn't, we just weren't doing it, you know, ideally before, and we have room for improvement. So students writing a thesis have a few uh, challenges. I mentioned the feeling, the pressure for significant results. It's probably common in your group too. Another key challenge is that we often, because of resource and budget constraints, don't have that many participants. We have low end studies and they have low inference value. But there's two things you can do with low N that you can do no matter, uh, you know, no matter your budget. First, you can pick designs that are more likely to be well-powered. That means like a uh, moderated uh, mediation is unlikely to be well-powered. Maybe you should pick a research question that doesn't require that. And I think that this is the highest quality. That is to say model complexity if you can't deliver you know, good inferences from it, is not worth very much to me. I would rather have a student write, well, we're constrained by these resources to this kind of size sample, so we chose a design to answer these research questions, which are important for this reason. For me, I'm like, that's honest, it's transparent, it's accessible, it's high quality. Not, uh, of course, uh, a caveat throughout this presentation is that I don't know what your supervisor thinks, so. You should, uh, you should always check with them before making major structural changes. Another thing which just catches my eye in this whole area is that students are often asked to collect new data, and it's good to collect data, particularly in a master's thesis, but it's not every student project that should come with data collection. Um, there is actually a lot of pre-existing data, and we don't know what it is or how to use it properly. And as part of that, I have a project uh, of free data, which is uh, a couple hundred openly available free psychological data sets. Some of them, you know, absolutely massive. If you look over here in the I column at how many people are in these, you see a couple there with hundreds of thousands of participants. So, so in some of these, you can test the kinds of complicated designs, moderated mediation, or whatever it is that you might be interested in with adequate power. So. 
this resource, since I put it together, has uh, drawn more and more users, and that's exciting, and I have used it more myself as well. I think such things like uh, doing more secondary data can be a major focus of uh, even MA and BA theses, as we do in my lab. And you can do both exploratory and confirmatory research. If you have any time to help enter metadata on the open psychological data sets um, sheet, which is a community resource that we um, maintain together like Wikipedia, uh, you can edit that directly or, or email me. So let's chat a little bit about pre-registration. Pre-registration is an option for you with your thesis. I consider it a high quality thing and I, man I uh, mandate it in uh, my own group actually. What it means is that you, you explain in advance of the data analysis. So this is before you even collect the data probably. You write down what are the key tests you're going to run? What are the key questions? How will they be tested? Like you're gonna use a between subjects, independent samples t-test on these two conditions. That might be what you would do in an experiment, for example. Or like just explain what you're going to do. And this can be uh, at different levels of specificity. Uh, there is not a single right way to do this. There's some tutorials and templates online, which you're welcome to use, or you can just write it in a blank document. There are strong signs that writing down what you're going to do in advance of doing it and then reporting what the results are is helpful to others, to your own research program and to others. And one example here is this meta-analysis of money priming. These plots on the right, you might not have seen before, they're called funnel plots. And the symmetry of the findings left and right around zero is the thing that are being paid attention to. So every dot is a study. And if there are more dots on, let's say the right than the left of zero in the funnel plot, then we think there is an ex a publication bias. There are probably more studies reporting false positives in that case. So you can see that in this meta-analysis of published studies, the top right, there seems to be a uh, false positive set of findings in the literature, so we maybe can't believe them. But in the pre-registered effects, they're clustered around zero. That is to say, there's no evidence of a bias. So pre-registration in this case seems to be reducing publication bias, which is a clear benefit. I am going to explain a few slides here from Chris Chambers, who's one of my academic heroes. He says, which part of a research study do you believe should be beyond your control as a scientist? How would you answer that for yourself? I think my answer is the results. I'm in charge of making the study high quality, but I can't control what the results are. And then what part of a research study do you believe is the most important for publishing in top journals and advancing one's career? You could even say maybe having a highly graded thesis. Again, it's the results. It's specifically the thing you can't control. This represents a problem for our field and is part of why I encourage supervisors and students away from significance and towards some of the practices we're talking about today. Registered reports are like a even bigger form of pre-registration that you can consider, probably not as part of your MA thesis, but in other zones. I wanna tell you what they are. What happens is authors submit a stage one manuscript. They have written the entire introduction methods and analytic plan in great detail and it needs to be well powered and maybe pilot data and then it goes out for peer review at a, at a journal notice the data haven't been collected yet this is just the framework of what the study would be and then usually there's changes whatever and then if re reviews are positive the journal says we promise to publish your paper regardless of how it works out then you do the research you run the analyses you said you would, you clarify any changes you needed to make because maybe you made a mistake in your original setup. You write the discussion new, but notice the introduction doesn't change because that was the motivation for doing the study, not something you rewrite after knowing the results. Then 
you uh, deposit your data materials in a public archive. It goes out to peer review again, but the peer review is not about whether this is novel. It's not about whether the reviewers thinks it thinks it's sexy. It's not about whether they uh, like expected those findings. All they do is check, did you follow your own protocol? If they decided at stage one that it was a question worth asking with these methods, then they decided stage two, just did you do your methods right? And then you publish. It doesn't matter if the hypothesis was supported, if P is this, if the results are novel, whatever. This to me is a better way of deciding on how to do science and what to publish. So I consider registered reports a gold standard. Um, has, uh, has anyone here had any experiences with registered reports? You can raise your hand in the, uh, in the Zoom if so. I'm just curious. Have you edited, uh, reviewed, or ever submitted one? Now, most of our MA students won't have had experience yet. Okay. So one of our co-supervisors has. I have as well. And I started working with these because the methods were the one part I could control, and I wanted to get credit for it. I wanted to be able to publish work that I had worked hard on. The peer review was much more collaborative and friendly than what I had experienced otherwise at journals, and the analysis was less stressful because when I hit that critical test. I didn't mind whether it came out significant or not, because it wasn't going to determine my career. Oh, this is a little bit more detail about this, like register reports are a subset of, you know, uh, study pre-registration. And then there's registered replication reports, which are specifically replications. But these are frameworks. And, you know, this is how it's working. And I'll give you a link to the slides at the end of the talk, if you want to look in more detail. So, uh, oh, this isn't updated. I have three registered reports now uh, from my group. I'm, I'm proud of them. I'd say out of all the work that we've published, those are some of the ones I would, I would be the most confident about. Two of them found uh, very few effects, you know, mostly null. And then one of them found very strong effects. So for me, the registered reports are like among my most uh, credible work. I'm not saying it's the most useful work, but it's the one I would be most likely to believe. What's good news is that registered reports are now mainstream. Uh, we have, um, I think, yeah, about 200 journals and about 300 registered reports total. Uh, and so they are taking off. This will become more common, but we're near the beginning still. I'm going to talk briefly about the Psychological Science Accelerator, which is a group of uh, psychologists who decided to join together. And, uh, and this is Patrick Forscher in the upper right there, who is a uh, yeah, early career researcher who helped uh, with the, the slides. It was Chris at the beginning on Twitter who sent out this tweet in 2017 and said, you know, we need, we need to do this in psych science. We need to do the same thing that physicists have done at the Large, large Hadron Collider and at, the, at CERN to, you know, pool their resources and improve power and generalizability. We need to do that here. And that was it. He just had an idea and then it sort of came together. And I just think it's worth mentioning that Chris is not at a big research university. He's at a relatively small university, you know, in Ohio. And it was just the collaborative effort of lots of early career people that made this happen. It wasn't like well-funded. It had no funding for ages and ages, et cetera. This is what it looks like now. Uh, one of those dots is, you know, here in Amsterdam, probably several, uh, and a world, a genuinely worldwide organization and about as global as you can get, uh, you know, in a, in a mainstream network of psychological science. Core principles of the network include uh, diversity and inclusion, not just in their membership, but also in the types of research that they conduct. Decentralization, there's no like person in charge per se. They have a director, but they, um, they're very democratic. Transparency in all their decisions, including about which research questions they select. A rigor and uh, an openness to criticism. I think those are wonderful values. One of the cool things about the accelerator is that, you know, maybe they run fewer studies than if all of them are running separate studies. But if they decide this study is worth doing, boom, they're going to run it in 20 languages at once. And I just think that that is so cool that you can bring together a group of researchers 
and really get a strong test of, uh, of some hypothesis. And then you can basically retire that question. You can say, okay, we, look, we have a really good answer to that large power, many samples, many languages, do it right, do it once together. And so you end up with papers like this uh, that have a really large amount of uh, authors. And if you look carefully, I'm in there somewhere. But this is one way to do science that is new, to join together, to add your resources together, and to get a better answer than you would have been able to otherwise. So you and the Accelerator, how could you get involved? Well, it's free to join. You can help them collect data. You can help review studies. You can just join the Slack group and talk to other people who are interested in these topics. Feel free to get involved. This is one of the most friendly you know, yeah, sincere, pleasant groups I've interacted with. I've been part of like 10 different professional organizations in my, yeah, fairly young career. Now, two bad things about the accelerator is that you would have less control over your studies. Like maybe if you have a big group, they, you know, there's methods they can't do or they decide to run things in a certain way. Okay. And authorship, contributorship gets messy when you have a hundred authors. It's not all journals even allow you to have that many authors, like PNAS doesn't uh, for certain formats, but these are manageable. Some of the major benefits are that your samples aren't so limited. Uh, you know, this acronym, WEIRD, it, it stands for Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. Unfortunately, 90% or more of the psychology studies you've ever read are on a really limited subset of the uh, uh, you know, humans alive, and it doesn't have to be that way. But the good news is that at a big, in, at, uh, with the accelerator, you don't have to be at a big research school or have a lot of money to do big science. And you can talk to lots of other cool and smart people worldwide. Okay, the last part of the talk here before I go to the questions, I just want to leave you with some resource, resources. Many of the slides today I adapted or borrowed from uh, Gilad Feldman. I mentioned him earlier, and he has a whole series of lectures and resources on YouTube, and he is particularly unusual in the amount of effort and time he puts into helping students and early career scientists do high, highest quality research. He doesn't focus on other smart researchers at his level. He almost entirely works with students and produces lots of replications and lots of high quality work, including registered reports. Here are some other talks that I think are among the best talks to think about. Um, yeah, for example, navigating open science as uh, early career feminist researchers up here in the right. And there's a paper associated with that presentation, highly recommended. So what, what are the sort of uh, take home principles of open science? Because a lot of this has been quite abstract, but I would say take home principles include transparency, share everything you did and allow people to assess what it was and, uh, and how they can then interpret what you're presenting. Everything should be shared and it can be made publicly available on sites like the open science framework for free. You, you, uh, you don't need to pay. You can sign up for a login and share anything. No one is going to come in and say, is this important? Is this whatever? It's everyone should share everything. In the MA process, I think that supervisors and students can do a change together where we make a shift away from novelty and complexity and towards rigor, accuracy, and simplicity. Now, this does have to be a negotiation. Some supervisors are a little bit more old school and some are really into this reform open science and you should figure out where your advisor is at and of course pitch your approach to succeed in their group. Uh, there is some variability and we should be sensitive to it. And, and I, don't, I also don't wanna say there's a right and a wrong approach period. There are benefits to doing things in traditional ways that are well proven and uh, ideally, you know, the best way forward is a match between the traditions and the reform. Openness is also good for your own work, separate from, uh, you know, <clears throat> separate from your thesis grade and separate from your advisor and all the rest of it. If you go forward and let's say you take a job and you write data, maybe you are 
writing your code at GitHub and it's uh, accessible to others and people can comment on it and you improve it over time. And indeed, there's many measures that open open you know access uh, software is uh, is better built and more widely used in the backbone of many companies in the internet because it's had more eyes on it and they can find more bugs and problems security issues whatever in terms of scientists open work is seen more uh, improved faster greater exposure cited more so in my case i definitely want to share everything i'm doing even the stuff that didn't work The, the last thing I want to say is if you have to slow down and do something like a pre-registration, I don't think it actually slows down your entire project. I think it just changes the order in which you do things. Normally, you would, uh, let's say, run your analyses, write them up, go through some negotiation with your supervisor about whether they make sense, and then go back and redo some analyses that you haven't done right. And one option is that you plan more ahead of time to match your design to your analyses. And thank God you do this before you run your study, because then you can run the design that makes the most sense for your analyses. And then afterwards, running the analyses is actually much faster because you have done some of that work up front. So for me, it's not even slower. It's just front loading the work a little bit. Openness is good for you. It's also good for everyone else. Uh, I'm probably becoming a bit of a broken record here. So let's wrap this up. Steps you can take personally, join a journal club like SIOS at the, at the UFA. I'll give you a link in a moment. Or there's these groups called Reproducibility where students come together and chat about uh, their projects and how to help each other. You can conduct uh, your project and manage all the files in the open science framework, the OSF, and that can remain private. You don't have to show it, but it can be a public resource in the future if you wanted to just click the button, make this public now that your thesis is done. And in the meantime, you'll never lose anything you know, when your hard drive crashes because you've stored things you know, online. I think valuing exploratory and descriptive research more would be another uh, useful shift uh, in most of your um, proposals, like supervisors don't need to see a mediation for a project to be worth running. And you can consider releasing preprints um, before or after you finish your thesis. You can write up your work and share it with the world at the SCI archive or on the, on the OSF. I, I don't see any negative to that. You worked so hard on these projects, you can share them. And that means you can also share that link, you know, on social media or with your colleagues or friends or family, whatever. You don't have to email them giant files. You can also update that over time so they can have the link to the most common, you know, the, the, the latest one. And then there's other things I talked about today that are medium difficult, like pre-registration and, and, uh, and some that might not apply during your thesis project. That's the scope. For the MA thesis specifically, I would say, transparent disclosure, don't orient your interpretation so much around significance, and share your open code and data if possible. You can talk to your supervisor about the data. These are other things you can do. You can look back at this list later. I mentioned earlier, not all scientists and teachers believe the problem is as bad as I do or that such changes are needed. So before making major structural decisions, talk to your supervisor. And this is the last one. So here are some links for you and, uh, and also on my email. And let me share with you in the chat um, the links to this. Okay, and then I'll put it back up. So that is the end. We have 20 minutes to chat with each other about open science in your specific situation. So, um, actually, you know what I'll do. Uh, so please, uh, yeah, please speak up and I'd love to hear from you. Now is the time. Thanks for the talk. Um, how long do you think it usually takes to you know, pre-register and things? Like how much time 
for example, now doing the thesis, should we um, calculate in for that? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends on the complexity of the project, but I don't think it's that much time. I think that in instead what happens during the pre-registration is that you realize all of the steps that you haven't yet formalized and then mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to formalize some of them but you 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 don't always do all of them and so then you know you can go as far as you have time for and then in the thesis itself you can say well these things were decided ahead of time these things we decided during the data analysis and it's not like a good or bad thing it's just total transparency as to what happened mm -hmm. Okay. It's a little bit hard to answer that question in the abstract, but I would say ours, definitely. I always tell my students that they, you know, I'd like them to pre-register, um, and then it's, it's a matter of copy and paste from the from the research proposal. Mostly, you don't have to do much extra work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if the proposal has been um, specified with the methods well, then it's not that much more. Yeah, I agree. More questions, and including from you, Bertian, if you want to chat about anything. One thing that this talk was relatively light on was, you know, specific advice about exactly what you can do to pre-register, like how that process works. I'll just talk through that for a moment and keep an eye on the chat in case anyone uh, has another question, which I would love to hear. But just in brief, you'll go to the Open Science Framework. You'll see that they have these registration templates. You know, sign up for a quick free account and then you can see that there are these templates where you can enter one for example and maybe it, you have a blank document okay and then you can paste just uh, the main parts of your research proposal like bear john was talking about or if you want a little bit more help you can use one of their pre-existing templates and it will ask you in a series of boxes what exactly are you going to do for excluding participants like which participants will you exclude based on their answers or based on the incomplete data or whatever. Okay. Now, which of your variables are you going to change if the answers aren't within a right range? You know, are you going to exclude participants who indicate their age as under 18 and over a hundred? Are you going to exclude participants who report their income as over a million dollars a year? Thinking through those things ahead of time is part of the process. And then you'll get through and it'll ask you what kinds of analyses and this and that. Now, I mentioned earlier the difference between exploratory and confirmatory. Exploratory research is totally high quality. There's no problem with it. It just means it's unconstrained. You don't know ahead of time exactly what you're gonna test. And confirmatory work requires that you plan ahead of time. We're gonna do this in this way. We're gonna compare this to that group using this statistical test. And if you haven't written that up ahead of time, and then you sort of just wing it as you go, which is the traditional way to do a thesis, then you're not really doing confirmatory work. It is a spectrum between exploratory and confirmatory, and both of them are valuable, but the distinction between them is becoming clearer over time. Any other questions or comments, including disagreements? Because I've taken a pretty radical position on some of these questions. Not radical, but strong, strong position on, on the necessity of these reforms. No? Well, then I am going to thank you for attending. We look forward to seeing you at the next uh, workshop to support your thesis. And I have, I don't know, two or three more to uh, teach as well. And, uh, and thanks for coming. Best of luck with your MA thesis. If you want to contact me, send me an email. I'm very happy to hear from students. And, uh, and I hope you have a good day. I will post this recording online. Thank you, everyone.